Hi, and welcome to this part two of a three-part video that's all about the Drill Point Gauge Project. The Drill Point Gauge Project is our introductory project to bench work. Now, when we left off in the last video, we had just completed drilling the holes. So, today we're going to start with tapping. In order to reduce the risk of breaking a small tap during a tapping operation, we're going to install our workpiece in a good bench vise. Now we want to install it so that the top surface is flush with the top of the jaws or slightly proud. Since we're going to be using quite small taps, we're going to use a T-handle to hold the taps and drive them into the hole. Now we're going to start with the 540 tap, just because in my life everything has to be in order. That means that we're going to be tapping hole A. Hole A is easy to find because we identified it earlier on in the project. Now to avoid seizing the tap in the hole, we're going to use a drop and really only a drop of tapping oil. Don't use just any oil for tapping. Use a true tapping oil. Since the workpiece is quite thin, we're going to be using starting taps only. So insert the starting tap into the hole and place it as perpendicular as possible to the work surface. Make one or two turns of the tap maximum, just enough so that the tap holds in place on its own. You can now remove the T-handle and using the square of your combination square, verify that the tap is truly perpendicular to the surface. This operation is aided by the fact that we positioned our part flush or proud of the vice jaws. Since the tap is only engaged by one or two turns at this point, it's easy to adjust its alignment. So adjust the alignment and continue the tapping operation. It's important that you don't hold the tap handle, but that you just turn the tap handle by applying an even pressure on both ends of the tap holder's drive bar. The tap has a hard enough time resisting to the torsion. It doesn't need to be bent as well. Now back off the tap regularly. This breaks the chip and reduces the amount of pressure required to tap the hole. I generally recommend a half turn forward and a quarter turn back. As your tap works its way through the part, it will become easier and easier to turn. Now since this part is quite thin, it is possible to tap a complete thread using only the starter tap. Other projects may incorporate deeper holes or holes that do not go through the work part. These holes might require the use of plug or bottoming taps. So I've installed my next tap, the 632, for hole B. I again apply a drop and only a drop of tapping oil and start to engage the tap into the workpiece. Again, I use my square to verify the tap's perpendicularity and I continue driving the tap through the part, backing off every now and then to break the chip. Now I know I've completed my tapping when the tap advances freely into the workpiece. Once the tapping is complete, I can back the tool out, change for the next tap required, and continue tapping in that fashion till all the tapped holes are completed. If all went well, your part should look something like this. We're now ready to lay out the lines defining the external shape of the part. Here are the tools that you'll need to scribe the contour lines of this project. We'll need our combination square and our scriber. We're also going to need a protractor for scribing our angular lines. We're also going to need a small and a medium sized set of dividers for scribing our radii. A small ball peen hammer and a prick punch will be used to make our layout permanent. We're going to start by scribing the line that passes through the point H and F. 
So lengthwise on the part, that famous original reference line, and we're going to do it with a scriber and our combination square. We're going to position the work part so that its reference surface is firmly up against the reference surface on the square. We're going to position the part also so that the ruler of the combination square passes through point H. And holding it firmly in contact, we're going to scribe our line. We can now scribe our 59 degree line, the line that passes through point F. And for that we're going to be using our scriber and our protractor. So it's very important that we position the ruler of this protractor at precisely 59 degrees from the reference surface of the tool. So there you go, 59 degrees from our reference surface. Now, when we position the part on the tool, we're going to make sure that the reference surface of our part is held firmly up against the reference surface of the tool. I also want to ensure that the ruler of the protractor, the one that I'm going to scribe along, passes exactly through the point F. Now I can scribe that line. Using the ruler of the combination square and the 30 seconds of an inch scale, we can set the points of the medium sized dividers at a distance of one and one eighth of an inch for scribing the largest of the two radii that we have to produce. Since I'm using the 30 seconds of an inch scale, I'm going to position the divider's points at 1 and 4 30 seconds of an inch. And I can scribe my radius from its center point, point G. Now we can basically redo the same series of operations, but this time using a small set of dividers. For the second of the two radii that we have described, we're going to use a spacing of one half inch. So I'm going to position my divider points at 16 30 seconds of an inch. I can now scribe this arc from its center, point H. We can now scribe our final line. It's a straight line that joins the two arcs that I've just completed. Now this line is tangent to both arcs. No other dimensions are given. So it's very important to position the ruler visually as accurately as possible. The best way to position the ruler would be to position it so that it hides the two arcs that you've just produced. Once the ruler is positioned so that you can just barely see each of the two arcs, well, you're tangent and you can scribe your line. By now, your part should look something like this. Now, before we finish our layout operation, we're going to have to make this light layout permanent. Now, as you can see, the layout is complete, but it's scribed very lightly. And that's good because a light layout means accurate layout work. But on the downside, it has a good chance of being erased before I complete the finishing of all the surfaces. Now, to avoid that problem, we're going to use a prick punch and a very light ball peen hammer to produce what's called 
a permanent layout. Now, a permanent layout consists of producing very, very small punch marks along the scribed lines that we've just produced. For straight lines, we need three points. For curves, arcs, or irregular lines, we're going to need several points to see the layout even if the original scribed line has been erased. Now find a flat, rigid, and stable surface to avoid that the part bounces around during the punching operation. Now the accuracy of this operation is crucial to the accuracy of the finished part, so take the time to do it properly. Now here's what the part should look like after the operation. We can see that we have three points along each of our straight lines and several points along our curved lines. Having completed this operation, you can now move on to cutting out the external shape of the part. Now we're going to start our cutting operation using a hand hacksaw and a number 18 hacksaw blade. We're going to cut just to the outside of the scribed lines, leaving one-eighth of an inch between the scribed lines and the kerf. There is no need to pass too close to the scribed lines. Remember that you do not want your saw cut to mar what will eventually become the finished surface of your project. After all, we're finishing the project by filing, so we have to leave some material. The hand hacksaw is a unidirectional cutting tool. That means that it cuts only in one direction. Since the teeth point in the opposite direction of the handle, the tool is only made to cut in that direction. There should be no or very low pressure applied on the return stroke. Now these blades are difficult to control because they have quite a wide set. Now, that makes for a blade that tends to want to not cut straight, so get used to cutting vertically. You should avoid trying to cut at an angle. If you have to cut an angular surface, rotate the part. That way, you can always cut vertically. As far as speed goes, this blade is a bimetal, high-speed steel-toothed blade. That means that somewhere around two strokes per second, should be sufficient for most mild metals, including mild steel. It should look something like this. We're going to start by cutting along our original reference line, which is our longest line, this one right here. And for that, we're going to have to hold the part in a vise to stabilize it. Now, it's important to note that vibration is something we want to avoid while sawing parts. Now you don't want to hold such a thin part this high out of the surface of the vise because the end becomes very flexible and that makes it very apt to vibrate. What you want to do is hold the part as deeply as possible in the vise to reduce the chance of vibration. Now as you can see, I've positioned the part so that my cut is vertical. As mentioned earlier, it's important to get used to always cutting vertically, so move the part not your cutting action. We can start our cut about one-eighth of an inch to the outside of the scribed line using our fingernail to guide the blade at the very beginning. Once the blade is engaged into the work part, we can start our cut 
using both hands and a very light cutting pressure. There's no need to force it. Let the blade cut. Now that the first segment is complete, we can raise the part a little higher in the vise, tighten it down well, and we're ready to cut again. We can now move the part in the vise to position our 59 degree angular line vertically. Now I know I've mentioned it a few times before, but it's very important that that line be vertical. Now it's very difficult to engage the plane in the work part angularly. So before we do that, we're going to have to notch the part. Then we can engage the tool into that notch to start our angular line. Now don't saw all the way to the finished surface that your cut is working its way towards. Leave a little tab. You can break off the excess material and that way avoid notching that finished surface. Standard hacksaw blades are not made to cut radii. They're made to cut straight lines and I'll admit they don't even do that very well. In order to get a nice radius on our project, we're going to cut with our hacksaw a succession of straight lines. That will bring us close to our finish radii. And then we'll use a draw filing technique to finish it off. So let's start with the largest of both radii. The one that's one and one eighth of an inch. And remember, we always position the part so that our cut is vertical. Now we can start our succession of cuts that will rough out our radius. We can now rotate the part slightly for our next cut. And there you have it. We've roughed out the largest of both arcs. Now we can do the same operation for the small arc and finish with our tangent line. 
If all went well, your part should look something like this. Not very nice. Luckily, we left a lot of material for finishing with the files. We're going to start by rough filing the outside contour of the part using a coarse double cut file and a cross filing technique. We're then going to finish all the external surfaces using a smooth single or double cut file and a draw filing technique. Well, we're ready for filing. So let's start with the straight line that was the original reference line of the project. Our objective is to get it straight and in the proper location. And for that, we're going to use our straight edge and the scribe line that we produced. For straightness, we're going to compare the straightness of our filed surface to our ruler. And for position, we're going to ensure that we file the part just flush with the scribed line. So let's start our cross filing operation with our coarse tooth file. We position the part deep in the vise to avoid vibration. We choose our coarse double cut file and we can start filing with our cross filing technique. You're going to want to verify regularly during the filing operation that your surface stays as flat as possible as you approach your scribed line. You have to remember that these are our finished surfaces we're moving towards. So even if we're roughing out, we're not going to be leaving very much material for finishing. So be very attentive to details. Remember, in the machine shop, we always want to work accurately. You may have noticed that I'm filing away from the 59 degree surface. That's because I really want to avoid notching it. Yeah, just a little bit more to take off of the end here, and my roughing cut for this surface will be complete. Well, that's enough for today. So we'll meet again in the part three of this drill point gauge project video. And in that part three, well, we'll be looking at finishing. So until then, have fun, be safe, and happy machining.